Well, hey everybody, and welcome into Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a very personal and very touching story. I have uh, Alicia to guest. Now, Alicia uh, was in an audience where I gave a, a speech a, a couple of years ago, and um, she also read my mum's book, Relentless. Um, and at the time, she said to me, uh, or, you know, she couldn't really relate to some of the stories, you know, obviously the running ones, but also mum's story of, you know, overcoming the odds and beating every 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 sort of odds that you could possibly have. Um, but last year, she was faced with a situation in her family where her father had a massive heart attack and collapsed at the age of 53 only, and um, was in a situation in the hospital and reached out for, for help. And uh, she shares in her words her experience. Um, and it's a very uh, deep, uh, mo deeply moving story and um, certainly quite a powerful and empowering one. And uh, I also share a little bit of my journey with my my father. So, you know, forgive that this uh, interview gets quite personal and this is our opinion and our experiences. Um, so look at it through the lens of that. Uh, but it is, uh, I'm sharing this because I want people to be empowered if they're ever in a situation like that and also what you can do to maybe prevent that and uh, what you can do if you're in that sort of a situation. Um, just give you some things to think about. So uh, uh, very generously, she agreed to share her story on the podcast uh, because she realizes that uh, she probably wouldn't have her dad today if she hadn't read my book and heard my speech and fought like crazy uh, <laughs> for her dad. Um, so uh, without giving away the whole story, um, please enjoy this one. It is quite deep and personal. And if you want to read my book that I wrote, uh, Relentless, which just tells mum's story, doesn't tell dad's story because we haven't got to that book yet. Um, and there's still many, many things that I'm unpacking from my journey with my dad. Um, <clears throat> but if you want to read Relentless, you can get that in my shop. It's available there. Uh, a very powerful and empowering story as well. So without further ado, now over to the lo lovely uh, Alicia Pina. Well, hi, everyone. And today I have uh, the lovely Alicia with me. And Alicia has a bit of a story to tell. And I had a very tiny, tiny piece um, to play in her story. Um, but I really wanted to share it with you guys because... Uh, um, um, both Alicia and I have been in situations with our dads and um, as you know my listeners and followers know um, you know I lost my dad three three years ago and it's been the hardest time of my life and um, some of the things that happened to him in the ICU were for me um, terrible um, uh, you know and and traumatic and um I have come through that experience with a very strong uh, viewpoint on on the way she, things should should go, and that you should be given the best chance to survive. And um, I mean, I'll share a bit more of my story later. But I wanted to get let Alicia come to word. Um, so, Alicia, tell everyone how we met and, and a little bit about yourself before we get underway and tell tell them your dad's story. So thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I really appreciate you catching up with me today. Uh, basically, uh, in a in a nutshell, a couple of years ago, Lisa attended um, a conference that was run by my mentors, and she shared her story about how she fought for her mum and fought, you know, just an incredible story that at the time I honestly didn't relate a lot with, but I shelved it as an important talk because there were naturally nuggets in everything. Um, and then just uh, last year, I had an experience where my father went through a very similar situation where I had to um, consider if we would keep fighting for his life or not. And if I hadn't heard from Lisa at this conference about her story, I probably would have let go of my dad earlier than I should have. Um, and so when we went through the situation, and we'll talk about it more in a second, uh, I contacted Lisa, just sent her a message to let her know how grateful I was for the talk that she had done two years prior um, and how much it had impacted the decisions that we had made. And then it was, you were so kind to respond. And so I'm really excited to catch up now and talk a little yeah. bit more. And you, and you managed to read the book too. Um, yes, uh, yes, really 
that was the point of then this was mum's story let alone dad's story but this was mum's story but again um and so unfortunately I've been through this a few times now <laughs> um, but um tell us Alicia what happened to your dad like your dad's really young isn't he mm -hmm. um but just suddenly one day yeah uh, so my dad was 53 at the time um and he just suffered a massive traumatic heart attack out of the blue he's a young healthy guy he's tall he's strong um and then just one day he was not it was crazy it was unexpected um i think the official diagnosis was a um, erupted cyst in his aorta or something i'm not entirely sure what it was it was tricky to understand all the doctor speak um but Sorry. that was yes it was completely random there was no lifestyle issues that were connected to it and yeah so he suffered a massive heart attack and it was the worst part of it was that in the process of attempting to resuscitate him he went 47 minutes without oxygen which would kill anyone and yes. the fact that he survived was just incredible yeah and he um unfortunately aspirated uh, so so the lungs were implicated tell us a little bit what happened there yeah so um if i could share the story of what happened he he was at the perfect place to have his heart attack i mean if, if we're going to look at the positives he was right outside a police station um and so he was responded to very quickly cpr straight away but in his process of having his heart attack he aspirated so a lot of the contents of his stomach and some of which were quite acidic at the time went straight into his lungs which caused significant complications later on as well in his recovery process and as well affected the placement of an oxygen tube when he actually got to the hospital um, when they managed to finally get him on oxygen they tried to put it into perspective to us that 47 minutes you would have no brain function left after having been without oxygen for that amount of time um, but they worked really hard on him. They definitely did. The fact that they worked hard on the CPR, so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, but they did mention to us that he probably wouldn't come out of this the same and that he wouldn't be able to do anything for himself. He wouldn't be able to talk or communicate. He probably wouldn't have any memories of anything because he'd basically be surviving if he could even come out of this, if he could recover from the aspiration and the heart attack and everything. And so he was actually unconscious. They kept him sedated, unconscious for four, four days. And we were at the hospital for a lot of time. They tried really hard to wake him up a few times, but every time they tried to wake him up, his whole system went haywire. And so they had to sedate him again straight away. And so after four days of being in hospital, the doctors very kindly took us to the side to talk to us about the gravity of the situation and suggested that we consider turning off his life support um, because there are, and, they, they worded it really well. They said, you know, we had to think about what he would want, not what we would want. So, but that did complicate other things because we had multiple perspectives of what he would want yeah. in the situation, my mum and my sister and I. Um, ultimately, when my mum my and my sister were leaning towards turning off his life support. But in this moment, um, I remembered Lisa's story about her mum. And at the time, I don't think we talked very much about your dad, Lisa but I remember the story about your mum. Yeah. And it was actually a bit in your book, if you wouldn't mind me sharing, that really carried me at this point. Um, quickly pick that up. It was uh, this con this compartmental compartmentalization. Um, yeah, um, where you said it gives you the chance to block out what's unnecessary, including emotions. So you don't run around like a cabbage head. Of course, it's important to accept that you will still have to deal with the emotional turmoil later, but it helps you to prioritize. And so because that was ringing, that sort of concept was ringing in my mind, I um, immediately switched off my emotions. And I don't honestly can't explain how it happened. You just do in that case, it's adrenaline or whatever. And I said to them, no, we're not switching off his life support. And Oh, I was probably a little bit rude and I said you haven't given him a proper chance to wake up so we can't actually assess where he's at um and so I said to my mum and my sister I said if even if we do get to wake him up in a few days time and he's not well I said I will stand by him and I will work with him through this I know that you guys have full-time jobs I'm very grateful that I don't I have a lot more free time I will work with him and we will help him recover as much as possible and I just had that ringing in my mind all the time. Naturally got right. to your book very quickly, Lisa, and I was eating up those pages because it was just so vital and it carried me through that time, um, just hearing your story. 
And then on day five, so the next day, they thought, okay, well, let's give it one more go. Let's try to wake him up one more time. And they did. They woke him up. He was calm. He was still very much not here because he was on so many different medications. But they asked him to squeeze their hand and they asked him to blink his eyes. And he responded to both those instructions without hesitation. And so then they knew, okay, got brain function. Like the fact that he was able to respond to those. And so they immediately told us and they said, this is really, really great news. It means that there is some kind of response. We don't know how much of them is there, but there's something. And that's when the big recovery process started. Amazing, amazing, Alicia. And this is the this is the thing. You 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 don't know in the time whether you're going to be successful. You don't know whether they're going to die anyway. You don't know. But the thing is, you don't know, and they don't know. And you you've got to give someone every chance. In my opinion, we go too quickly to the let's turn off life support because it costs a lot of money. You've got to understand the amount of resources that it costs to have someone in ICU. So you have to think as a loved one from that perspective that that's what they're looking at and weighing up. And in the case with my father, which was, you know, I mean, I'd already been through this whole thing with my mum, but then with my father, they were really pushing us to take him off life support. And in my case, he had had a autic aneurysm, the same as your dad, but down here further in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And he'd survived a, a massive six hour operation 28 units of blood like they did and he was 81 but he was extremely powerful strong man healthy man and he he um came through the operation against all odds but he developed sepsis and I had done the research previously on intravenous vitamin c and I had come across research in regards to intravenous vitamin C and uh, sepsis and uh, the work of Dr. Paul Merrick and others and how that if you put massive doses of vitamin C that you could uh, reduce um, the mortality rate by 48%. And so I started to fight for uh, vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C in, in in the hospital system and came up against an absolute brick wall. And so I had to fight for day in, day out, while my dad's deteriorating in front of my eyes, while he's dying and there is, you know, getting less and less options and then them starting to force us to put him, uh, take him off life support and me fighting and saying, I'm not taking him off life support. I want this vitamin C. And I had to go up against the ethics committee and then things like weekends would come when nobody's working in the weekend. And, you know, you're just desperately holding on because your dad's dying and his organs are failing. And um, I eventually won the right to let my GP come into the hospital um, and administer uh, IV vitamin C. Now, what they didn't realize in this whole battle that was going on is that I wanted that every six hours. That was the protocol. That was with the clinical research that I'd brought to them. That said to me at the beginning, the clinical research is completely irrelevant to us. We don't care about the clinical research. This is a legal matter. Our asses are on the line if we do something and then your dad dies. I said, he's dying anyway. I will sign whatever you want to sign. And they said, no, we will still be in the firing line. And so therefore we can't. And so I had to get every single doctor and every single nurse and the whole of the ICU team on board to do this. And um, I eventually got my wonderful GP came up into the hospital. And this was now, unfortunately for us, 15 days into the battle. And so we were like, you know, dad was at multiple organ failure, death's doorstep, could die any minute and we did the first vitamin c and it started to reverse the like it dropped his crp in half which was massive it was still high but it was massive his kidney function went from 27 percent to 33 percent and he and they got him off noradrenaline and they were able to he was able to maintain his own blood pressure and and then I said I need this every six hours now my doctor could only come up in between her surgery so that was 12 hours and then they stopped me doing it they did all sorts of of things like get me out of the room while the doctor came in to do it and then tell her there's no there's no IV line for you we can't do it and she went away and I'm like what the hell I've been waiting you know like um, so there were things like this going on in the background and this is the absolute truth you know Mm -hmm. and so 
and and so we 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 managed to get three IV vitamin C's in, but they were over eighteen hours apart, which is just too. And, and it was very small. She would only do fifteen grams. We needed thirty grams plus. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, on day three, she came in and she said, "I've looked at all his obs, and there is now no way back." And she was the only doctor that I trusted in that situation. Mm -hmm. When she told me that, and I could see my dad, you know, suffering, and and at this point, that's when I agreed. But if I'd had the vitamin C earlier on in the piece when I wanted it, would my dad be with me now? I'll never know. All I know is the clinical research and the clinical research is conclusive. The earlier you can get that in, the better your chance and thiamine and the other things that were in Dr. Paul Merrick's study. Um, and there have been other studies since. And while that would never be a guarantee that he would have come out, I would have had a chance, you know? And so it's very just ironic that, you know, we fought for my mum. We managed to save her life and we fought for my dad with everything I had. I mean, I threw the bus at it and we didn't win. But the beautiful thing about your, your, your contacting me and reading my book and coming to my speech and stuff is I feel like my dad's death has not been in vain, if that makes sense. And, you know, I'm going to let you come to word and tell the rest of your story. But um, it feels to me like, you know, my dad is on hopefully on the other side and influencing this. And the, and I hope through this recording that, you know, my dream is to change the law in New Zealand, that you have the right to try. In America, in some states, they have a right to try law, which is where if you're at the end of life and the doctor's got no more, more options, that you're allowed within reason, obviously, to do things like this. Yeah. Um, and that you you know sign the papers that they're not responsible and 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 that you have the right and I believe this would be um, um, you know an absolutely necessary law here everybody is talking about you should have the right to die and you should have the right to turn off your life support and I was told with my mum you should sign a non resuscitation order and and I absolutely flatly refuse because I believe that life is precious and I will fight tooth and nail and I've worked for eight years rehabilitating my mum so I'm not coming from talking at a you know a hole out of my backside I know what it takes to rehabilitate someone but is that worth it for me it was definitely worth it mm -hmm. and 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 I know that my dad had always joked if I'm ever in the situation you know just pull the plug but when it came down to it my dad was fighting alongside me and it was his wish to continue to live he was intubated, but he was able to tell me enough that I want to fight and I want to stay with you. You know, um, he was. Uh, they took the the tube out of, and on on day three. They thought we had him, and he he told me in no uncertain terms that he wanted to keep fighting. And in the following days, when he was re-intubated, he still told me with his eyes. I said, "Dad, do you want me to keep fighting?" And he would squeeze my hand and go, "Yes, please." You know, um, so that that fueled my fight to keep fighting for him. Um, it's a, it's a powerful story, and I think your dad's story is is even more powerful because your dad woke up and, and tell us about what happened then after he did wake up. Well, it's interesting. I just wanted to um, mention with your father communicating with you that he wanted to fight and he wanted your support. Um, unfortunately, in these first early days, my dad wasn't able to communicate that because he was in a coma. But once, I think it was near the end of his ICU stay, he started getting a lot of his memories back. He still doesn't remember the incident itself, but he remembers very distinctly one morning, two doctors or two nurses or someone standing over him and talking about the potential of switching off his life support. And he says that in his heart, even though he was out, you know, he could hear. And in his heart, he was saying, just wake me up. I want to yeah. live. Yeah. He, he had had this in his heart. He couldn't communicate it. And how many people can't communicate that desire to live because they are in a state where they can't and how easy it is to just switch it off, you know, yeah. because they haven't had that opportunity to co communicate what's actually yeah. important to them. It made us rethink our entire, like we, we wrote out our own desires, like in a clear document wow. after that, so that if anything like that was to happen to us, that people would know exactly what to do in the situation. Um, and when you were also mentioning that fighting for the vitamin C, one thing that we did, um, in the ICU, my mom and my sister and I at the time, because of COVID rules, only two of us could be with him at a time. And so we had a rotating schedule. 
but we kept an eye on his numbers and we yeah. asked the nurses, we said, can you tell us what that means? Can you tell us what that means? What is this? What are we looking for? What's positive? What's negative? Because they're over, you know, they're, they're overwhelmed. overwhelmed. They don't have time to keep an eye on all the small details. And one thing we noticed is all his numbers popped up positively whenever he had magnesium being. Wow. To him. And wow. so we pushed that that was a regular thing because the more magnesium that he had, the more he seemed his body seemed to respond well to whatever treatments they were giving him. And he was on so many different medications, you know, and contra, con, what's the word, con, contra and indications yeah, contraindications and they had to try and balance that out with another medication and everything so it was a long road um he still you know he was he was intubated for a very long time started causing issues with um you know infection and such in his lungs because of the aspiration and the tube so ultimately when he was well enough they ended up switching to a tracheostomy um because that way they could have a clearer sort of keep everything a bit more hygienic yeah. um and that was a big challenge. That was, yeah. And there was lots of things like that, that we had to be very, we had to ask for things a lot and yes. we had to point out numbers a lot. And it was really on a negative side, which was really sad. There was one particular nurse who my, my dad later would say he didn't trust her. Yeah. Um, but for us, we, we, we just didn't like her. Let's just say we didn't like her. And there was one point when I was asking her about some of his numbers, some of the things that were on the screens. And she said, well, if if I had been with you to start off with, I wouldn't have told you what all that meant. Oh, she basically, she said. Oh, she basically, like said, you know, she basically said she was like, I wouldn't have told you what that means because we shouldn't be telling patients' families what everything means. Bullshit. Exactly. I like true. you find out what it means because they can only give so much. They're not emotionally attached to the person you are. Yeah. You're, you're the one who's fighting for their life. They're doing their job arrogance the arrogance of that just makes me because I did exactly the same thing I started to study because we had a medical misadventure like just going back to mum's story she yeah. was missed for six hours left with a brain aneurysm mm -hmm. and they just said she's having a migraine so that put me on high alert when we found out that it was and I went okay they're not going to always pick up things so I'm going to be hyper vigilant and I had no medical background but I've got a good brain and so I started to study and I studied and I studied and I haven't stopped studying and I study every day, three or four hours a day, because I don't want to miss anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I now work with a lot of people and yeah. I have them, right? Um, you, you, you need to, to trust yourself, to study, to understand and to be hyper vigilant because as you say, you get people like that. And I've had an, a lot of um, uh, medical professionals like that who just wanted to write them off. They don't care. This is not their mum. This is not their dad. And they are another statistic and they're on to the next one. And so you've got to understand that. You've got to understand the limitations that they're overworked, they're tired, they're under-resourced as well. And then they have strict limitations and then a lot of them have institutional sort of a, 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 a way of thinking, a very narrow way of thinking that does not take into anything into account that is outside of their narrow pharmaceutical view. That's that's my very strong opinion. And there are, you know, the goods and bads of that. They're brilliant at things like surgery, brilliant at things like drugs and all of that. A lot of these drugs cause massive nutrient depletions. Mm -hmm. A lot of the illnesses cause massive nutrient depletions, like the vitamin C, like thiamine, like these, these magnesium, mm -hmm. like these things that are crucial if that person is going to recover. And, you know, and then there is this whole systemic uh, problems because of the legal side of things as well. So you're fighting not only the illness or the thing that the person's fighting, you are fighting against all of that to try to get them to, to survive this. And so by empowering, and I've worked with a number of people who, who loved ones are in ICU dying and they've reached out for help because, and, and most of them we lose most of them we've lost and a lot of them I've been we've been fighting for vitamin c we've had lawyers we've had professors we've had the clinical research we've had things mm -hmm. and nothing happens because and and you are fighting up against the clock this person is dying in front of your eyes yeah. you've got to go hard and and it, it's just it to me it's um it's just wrong it's morally wrong um and the system needs to change and so that i now try to work on the positive side of prevention 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 so you don't get there unfortunately 
things can come out of the blue, like your dad's. You, you can't prevent everything. We can lower our risk factors, but you can't prevent everything. Um, so understanding where you're at and, you know, there are, and understanding that there are people like that nurse mm -hmm. or doctors that have a very arrogant point of view. You're, an, you're a loved one. You have no medical background. You're probably an idiot. Mm -hmm. and, and they treat you as such. Um, that's got to stop. And it's important to know that you 100% have the right to ask for different people to care for your loved ones as well. Like we, we went to the charge nurse and we explained our situation and we said, we don't want this person looking after my yes. father. Yeah. And they were obligated to get someone else. And it worked out fantastic. We had made some great relationships with a few of the other nurses there. Um, every now and then we'll still stop in at ICU because they need a positive story as well. They need to see exactly. someone who has come through, see someone they have helped. And so we'll stop in so that the people can see who, who they saved yeah. when they put all their effort and their love into it. Um, and another thing that we did and we pushed for, well, okay, it was, it was probably a little bit, um, it's probably a bit more personal, but I insisted that I have the right to decorate his room yes. in a way that can help him recover. And so I had positive, I had positive quotations on the wall. I had pictures of his family. I put it all up so that he could, when he's lying there, unable to do anything, he's seeing what he's fighting for. Because exactly. at some, at one point, we all had to go back to life yep. as we knew it. My mum had to go back to full time work. My sister had to go back to Auckland. Um, I, my husband wasn't able to keep caring for the children full time. So, and I couldn't keep them at the hospital. It would be different if it was a home setting because they could be around at the same time. Um, and so we all went to life as normally as possible. And he was alone for hours of yep. the day. And there's no one to look after him except the one nurse who's keeping an eye on his, 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 his little state, his observations. So he needed something to remind him what he was fighting for. And it's been incredible to see the, the recovery since then. He, um, he lost a significant amount of uh, muscle, mu excuse me, muscle mass while he was stuck in the bed. Uh, one of the things I started noticing, similar to what you pointed out, was that drop foot um, with, with your mum. And yeah. so, uh, so I would do the exercises before yep, you look we did it. some exercises with him. We didn't, we didn't actually... Um, and because my father is really tall as well, he doesn't fit on any hospital equipment. He's too big for it. And so it was even more so like you could notice things. They And they don't notice those little things because they're so much focused on the more like life. Keeping life your life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're yeah. focused on hearing the ringing bells. They're not so focused on watching the little differences. So my mom and my sister and I would massage his feet. We would do everything we could just to keep them in a good space. Um, and then when he finally had his trachea and he could communicate with us, the amount of gratitude he was able to communicate, it just warmed our hearts. Um, oh, and, nice. and so he still, you know, sometimes he still doesn't realize how big the entire event was. No, he doesn't no. realize it all because a significant portion of his memory is interrupted with with Which is good. And everything. Which is good. He, has, he had some hilarious hallucinations, Lisa. Yeah, oh, so um, um, she had some real yeah. crackers when she... Yeah. <laughs> But he's working now. He's full-time working again. He's able to look after himself. He's exercising. There are still complications that we have to deal with. Um, a part of his left ventricle is is no longer functioning in his heart. Um, and he has uh, about a thumb size blood clot that's sitting in there because of it. And so they've got to keep him on various like, medications and things. But we've gotten him onto a vitamin regime. We've gotten him onto an exercise program that works for him that doesn't overtax his heart. Um, he's now got an Apple Watch to keep track of everything as well um, so that he can see where everything's happening. Um, and he's functioning 100%. He's playing with my daughters. He's 100% oh, wow. he's himself and even better, I would say, coming through that. And I'm so grateful for it because I know, like you say, Lisa, the majority of the stories don't end happy like that. No, they don't. They don't. And, and, and because you fought so hard and he fought so hard and I'm sure that the, the, the rehabilitation process was arduous, mm -hmm. difficult, tough for yes. everybody involved for him. I know that. I live it every day. Um, but he is back with his family. He's there for your grandchildren, you know, like just all these beautiful things that you get to now, now live and experience with him because you fought. 
and and this is the message that I want people to take away from today is just don't just go, oh, they're the professionals, leave it up to them. Be hyper vigilant, do all the extra things like, you know, like you said, um, you know, touch and, and, and massage and, and watching for changes in the body because you were there for hours and hours on end. Um, I, I would pick up things that they, they weren't picking up. I would notice when something was going awry because they can't, they've got a thousand other patients that they've yeah. got to deal with. Um, and, and research, you know, like drop foot is something that I've had to deal with for now still mum's foot doesn't work properly. If I had knowing about drop foot I could have prevented that whole drama uh, from the very beginning by doing the exercises earlier unfortunately I didn't pick that up until what I know year two or something um, that that was such a thing um, mm. and so there's little things like that and um, it's a very empowering story Alicia I'm, I'm, I'm just so glad that you are so beautifully sharing this with with us because um, it'll help other families other people in this sort of situation and, and life is precious once you die that's it forever you not you don't ever come back right and that concept of forever is sometimes hard for us to grasp when we're tired we're stressed we're being pushed into a direction um, and and I still have nightmares and I still have trauma from from the experiences that I went through and I still have moments of why did I let them take them off life support even though intellectually I know that at that point a, a doctor that I trusted told me I did not trust the people in ICU anymore um, not when they they believed that he was gone they also believed that my mum was gone and I was told over and over again she's never going to have any quality of life put her into an institution and just like you I knew that if I could get her home surrounded by her things her loved ones her memories her photos it's on some level even though she was like you know um, massively brain damaged and, you know, not much mm -hmm. over a vegetative state, um, that she would understand on some level that she was loved and that she was wanted and that she would have a reason to fight. If, if she was in an institution somewhere stuck in a corner, why the hell would you fight? Mm -hmm. You know, so she she had that and, and that did help her come back and the familiarity of things and the fact that we were there focused on her recovery and it put the massive massive strain on the family you know but um this is, discomfort is worth it in the end isn't it Lisa because yeah. like the value of Fano outweighs everything else yeah. um when we got my dad home the recovery was long but my daughters who are two and four now they were one and three at the time um they were aware of all these things like I would tell them oh it's important to pick up your toys and my eldest would say oh yeah we don't want grandpa to fall you know yes, over the toys they were able to take part in his recovery because we we, yeah, we we ended up moving in with him for a few months just to help out while he sort of did that um and it was it, were, it was just incredible to see that family dynamic grow so like I definitely think as soon as someone is able to function without all the extra equipment get them home get yeah, them yeah. into an environment that is familiar to them um maybe make some changes to make it safer I guess you know you have to make some changes in that oh, yeah. sense yeah yeah but yeah. then when you have that family and you say you know you see what you're fighting for every single day the recovery shot up like this the acceleration of his recovery went up significantly as soon as he was home amazing and so, amazing yeah, really cool and and you know look there um over there's mummy mummy Hi. <laughs> having her pills yes, good, <laughs> and, good. And her horrible tasting drinks and things that she has to have in the morning but that's a part of her recovery and uh you know but she's here with me you know we miss out that every single day you know and I'm just so sad that he wasn't I don't feel like he was given the best chances to, of survival uh, I, I, I take my hat off to the, to the surgeons the surgeons were absolutely amazing um, but there were some other things that weren't good you know there were some really good doctors and there were some ones that you know I had one doctor come in um, this is when I'd finally got one vitamin C and he came in the next morning and he just he, he just said at the, at the at the entrance to the room he goes oh the old bugger's still alive and I and um, my father could hear you know and uh, I thought he'd be dead by now. So I told the doctor not to come in for the vitamin C. 
that's the sort of shit that was going down. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and he said that in front of my father, in mm -hmm. front of me, and I had to go and fight to get the doctor back who couldn't come for another because of a shift. The yep. chief. So, you know, that type of doctor is not, should not be there. Yep. Unfortunately, we have them. And it's, it's, that's why it's so important, I think, when I talk to medical students, just talk about people skills, you know, really yeah. basic people skills. Look at, look at it from the perspective, yes, you can't allow yourself to be emotionally involved in every patient you deal with. That's true. But consider from a logical perspective, what they're going through and what their family's going through. Um, my husband is a nurse himself and wow. he's had to face these things in his practice. He's faced the same limitations, you know, of what he can and cannot do to yep. help people. Yep. And um, so, I mean, we have to have grace for them, like you say, for the doctors. Because some things, you know, the legal system is an issue, but then there are some people who really just need to learn that it's more than just a body in front of you, it's a person. It's a person and it's a family and it's a, it's a whole lot more than that. Yeah. Unless you've been so generous with your with your sharing your very uh, deep story today, and um, I really appreciate your your openness. My love to you, your your dad, your mum, uh, your kids, and you know I'm just so glad that we uh, got to have a little bit of a, a, yes. a play, and I feel a piece of that journey, and I and I feel that 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 sort of helps me. Uh, me emotionally with my you know getting over my dad's um passing because okay. I feel like he's had a little bit to play and mum's had a little bit to play in this mm -hmm. story so thank you for sharing today thank you for reaching out and it's been a real privilege to spend some time with you this morning Lisa so thank you and thank you for sharing your story <laughs> started it all <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> wonderful thanks Alicia